Welcome to a scientific presentation on the origin of Darwin's reef types. This talk is based on a paper that I published in 2014 in Scientific Reports and is listed in the credits at the end. In 1842, Charles Darwin proposed that there was an evolutionary sequence between fringing reefs, barrier reefs and atolls, the three main reef types. He thought that fringing reefs grew vertically into barrier reefs and then into atolls as their volcanic islands subsided. And this led him to suggest that all barrier reefs and atolls must be developed in areas undergoing subsidence. But as the science of his day advanced, he realised the sea level rise wasn't simply due to subsidence, but must have occurred at the end of the Great Ice Age as the ice caps melted. Geologists had already discovered evidence of a recent widespread glaciation, but thought it consisted of one long glacial cycle, with a single fall and rise of sea level. In fact, the Ice Age consisted of multiple glacial cycles and the sea level oscillated several times. And that was only realised much later in the 1950s when Cesare Emiliani linked glaciations with temperature cycles in deep sea cores. This single fall and rise assumption is the fatal flaw in Darwin's subsidence model because an Ice Age with multiple glacial cycles would produce a barrier reef every time sea level rose at the end of each cycle and this would generate multiple barrier reefs around the same volcanic island, instead of the single barriers that we see today. So in other words, Darwin's vertical growth mechanism is untenable during glacial cycles. Now during Darwin's day, most accepted the vertical growth argument, but were unhappy with postulating subsidence in all areas where barrier reefs and atolls existed. And so in 1910, Reginald Daly proposed that it was in fact the ice age and sea level changes that caused different reef types to develop. He speculated that reefs couldn't withstand the cold glaciations, and as shorelines lost their reef protection, they began to erode. His idea was that the three reef types didn't form an evolutionary sequence that Darwin proposed, but were instead related to the amount of shoreline erosion. Partial erosion would produce a shelf where a barrier reef would grow during sea level rise, and if the island was completely eroded, an atoll would form instead. Daly's idea embraced sea level change during the Ice Age and therefore advanced science, but it was still unknown that the Ice Age consisted of multiple cycles. So Daly's idea of vertical growth had the same problem as Darwin's. Multiple sea level cycles would produce multiple barrier reefs around the same island. By the 1970s, the glacial cycles had been confirmed by dating of reef terraces on Barbados, and it was widely accepted that they generated multiple episodes of sea level rise and fall. Using this consensus, Edward Purdy suggested in 1974 that it was the karstic dissolution of carbonate terrains during glacial low stands that caused barrier reefs and atolls to develop. He argued that long periods of glacial casting produced, produced solution rims, which when flooded by post-glacial sea level rise, provided topographic residuals over which reefs could grow. So Purdy was also claiming that the reef types don't form an evolutionary sequence, just as Dalian had done. However, both these geologists made some dubious assumptions. Both assumed that reefs couldn't develop during cool glacial conditions, even in fully tropical areas. We now know this is incorrect. Drilling on Barbados and Tahiti has shown that reefs thrived in the tropics during glacial conditions and kept pace with 120 meter post-glacial sea level rise. But he also assumed that reef growth was insufficient to form significant vertical structures and couldn't even account for its own surface topography, such as spur and groove. In other words, he claimed that the substrate morphology provided a blueprint for the three reef types. We now know that this growth assumption is incorrect and work on the Huon Peninsula and Tahiti and Barbados all show that reefs have formed impressively thick structures in the last 14,000 years and they're not simply thin veneers over lumps in the bedrock. So barrier reefs and atolls can't develop from Darwin and Daly's simple vertical growth mechanism because this is inconsistent with glacial eustatic cycles. Otherwise we'd have multiple concentric barrier reefs around each island. Purdy's mechanism of corals veneering karstic rims is possible, but not if reefs can grow vertically and generate their own morphology, which we know they can. So after 175 years of thinking, we're back to square one. 
What mechanism produces reef types during glacial eustatic cycles? And do they form an evolutionary sequence or not? To uncover the origin of Darwin's reef types, we decided to take a look at how reefs developed around the South Pacific island of Tahiti. After all, Tahiti was where Darwin saw his first coral reef, and where his reef evolution idea first came into focus. Apart from this historical connection, Tahiti's reefs have been extensively cored more than any other reef in the Indo-Pacific. Cores have been taken from the Barrier Reef Crest off Papiti, and IODP Leg 310 collected cores from the reef front slopes off the north and south coast at Tiri and Mara. So if we want to see our fringing reefs transition into barrier reefs, Tahiti should be the perfect place. First things first, what do we know about Tahitian reef development from these cores? Well, we know the position and rate of post-glacial sea level rise. Several studies have published coral dates from the barrier reef and reconstructed sea level back to 14,000 years. And this reconstruction has recently been extended to 16,000 years using dates from the IODP reef front cores. So we have a reasonable idea of what sea level is doing during reef development. Second, we know that the Barry Reef at Papiti started at 90 metres depth around 14,000 years ago. And that's almost immediately after Meltwater Pulse 1A, which is the first major acceleration in post-glacial sea level rise. We know that the Barry Reef cores have a lagoonal assemblage at the base dominated by fragile corals. And this is replaced at 65 metres by a reef crest assemblage dominated by robust, fast-growing Acropoulos. We know from the IODP cores that the reef front assemblages at Mara and Tiri started at 125 metres depth about 16,000 years ago. These cores show a deepening up sequence where shallow coral assemblages are replaced by deeper ones through time. And we know that for the, some reason, Acroporas are pretty much absent in these assemblages before 12,000 years and then dominate after. But none of these studies identified any fringing reef sequence. No fringing reef was found beneath the Papiti Barrier Reef. No fringing reef was found at the base of the reef front course. So in other words, no transition between reef types was found. So why did the Barrier Reef develop where it did when it did? And before the Barrier Reef, what type of reef existed as sea level was rising? And why were the fast-growing Acroporas absent before 12,000 years? How does this all fit together? To answer these questions, we went to the IODP core shack at Texas A&M University and logged all 37 cores ourselves. We used the IODP drilling and wireline data like caliper logs and downhole imagery to confirm core recovery and depth. And we logged the cores to identify persistent sedimentary units, not coral assemblages as was done before. We calculated the paleo water depth of all dated corals using the coeval corals approach. And finally, we combined logs from closely spaced sites into a type section, which helps us determine the lateral persistence of the units. The coeval corals approach used to determine paleo water depth is fairly straightforward. All we did was compare the depth of the dated coral in question with the depths of corals of the same age. And we assumed that the shallowest coral grew at sea level or if there was a gap in the dates, we used a minimum sea level curve, smooth to cover the data set. Where possible, we corroborated the depth of the shallowest corals using coral growth form, which gets more robust as wave energy increases into shallow water. On the right, you can see these changes in Priscilla Pora, which assumes a compact branching form in high energy conditions. In fact, in very shallow water, its branches are so rounded and stubby that its common name is the cauliflower coral. OK, so what did we find in the reef front cores at Mara? Like the previous studies, we confirmed that the paleo water depths of the dated corals at the base of each core started shallow and ended up deep. In other words, they deepened up. But we also discovered a fringing reef unit at the base of nearly every core we looked at. And the few paleo water depths from this unit confirmed it was shallow. 
within three meters of sea level. Furthermore, the dates directly above the unit show a depth gap of 10 meters or more, suggesting that there was a no growth zone on the shelf in front of the fringing reef. This lack of coral growth proves there was no barrier reef in front of the fringing reef like there, like there is today. In other words, it was a high energy fringing reef exposed to open ocean conditions. And because it's the first unit in the cores above the underlying substrate, it must have grown right at the shore and been exposed to a high sediment flux. Not only was the fringing reef exposed to sediment runoff from the island, but also the resuspension of that sediment by wave action. Once it was in the system, the sed sediment couldn't be removed because there was no lagoon to trap it. So in other words, sediment stress made it a marginal environment for reef development. Can this interpretation be corroborated by coral growth forms? Well, if you look at these fringing reef units, you notice several things. First, there are no fast-growing acroporas, like there are in the barrier reef unit. All corals are either stubby branch bacilloporas or encrusting montiporas, which are both stable in high flow regimes. The corals are densely packed together, with large attachment surfaces making them difficult to dislodge, which is another indication of high wave energy. And all voids within and between the corals are packed with coarse sandy sediment, suggesting a high sediment flux. And finally, there are smooth coral truncation surfaces, possibly due to wave abrasion. So these observations are all consistent with the idea that the fringing reef corals grew in a tough environment, regularly pounded by waves laden with coarse sediment. We found the same thing at Thierry. There was a fringing reef unit at the base of every core, with paleo water depths confirming growth in 2-3 to three meters of water. And the dates directly above the unit show a similar depth gap of between 5-10 to 10 meters suggesting that there was a no growth zone and thus no barrier reef. So the fringing reef at Thierry was also an open ocean type exposed to large waves and high sediment flux. This was also corroborated by the coral growth forms. Stubby branching pasilloporas with large attachment surfaces and voids filled by coarse sediment and no acroporid corals. Like Mara, the fringing reef at Thierry was also an open ocean type with a high sediment flux. Next, we compared accretion rates for all shallow reef units in both the IODB cores and the Papiti Barrier Reef cores. Accretion rates were high in both, coming in between 10 to 16 millimeters of vertical accretion a year. But the fringing reef unit had a significantly lower accretion rate of around three millimeters a year. Now the reason for this is obviously it's low accretion, uh, high wave energy and lots of sediment washing around. And under such harsh conditions, the corals adapted as best they could, but basically they lived fast and died young. And sediment intolerant species like acroporids, which normally grow rapidly and dominate their environments, were completely excluded. So these fringing reefs were trapped against the shore and low accretion prevented them from building either upwards or outwards to escape these harsh conditions. Okay, so let's see what happened to the fringing reef as sea level rose. When you plot all cores according to the depth of the underlying substrate, you see two things. First, the fringing reef forms a thin diachronous layer that gradually retreats upslope between 16,000 and 14,000 years ago. When it reaches 106 meters, it jumps vertically 13 meters before resuming its retreat again. And this jump corresponds to the drowning and re-establishment of the fringing reef during meltwater pulse 1A, which was the first major acceleration in post-glacial sea level rise. And the second thing you see is that acroporids are absent before 13,000 years. But after that date, they dominate the reef front and barrier reef units, as was previously reported. So the fringing reef has retreated upslope. What happens next? How does it transition into a barrier reef? The last date we have on the fringing reef is 14.2 thousand years, from about 93 meters in core 23. But the highest fringing reef unit is at 87 meters in core 7. And this unit has the same elevation 
as Lagoonly units at the base of the barrier reef, which are 13.8 thousand years old. So in other words, the last fringing reef likely existed until about 13.8 thousand years ago. There are similar problems figuring out when the Papiti Barrier Reef started. The first Barrier Reef crest unit occurs at 65 metres, around 12.5 thousand years. But this age and elevation don't represent the first crest unit that formed because lower units are lagoonal and imply that the crest was in a more seaward position. Now if this is correct, then it tells us that the transition from the fringing to Barrier Reef likely took place at 87 metres, around 13.8 thousand years ago. But we can't prove exactly when and we can't show exactly where. So what caused the transition? Is there anything at 87 metres to explain why it would occur at that depth? Well, if you look at the substrate at 87 metres, it consists of a level limestone platform composed of a reef flat unit with an age that corresponds to the last interglacial. In other words, this platform is the reef flat that developed during the last high stand 125,000 years ago. And since that time, it subsided at least 87 metres. This is what the last interglacial reef flat looks like in core. Small, encrusting corals, a little more delicate than in the fringing reef units, and large amounts of crustose coral and algae inter intergrown with vermetids, some of which are only found in the intertidal zone, and voids filled with coarse, well-sorted coarse sand. And these features are all typical of modern reef flat units. OK, so let's recap our new findings. First, we discovered a fringing reef unit at the base of almost all reef front cores. And that fringing reef had a low accretion rate compared to the other shallower units. We demonstrated that the fringing reef unit retreated upslope between 16,000 and 14,000 years ago and was interrupted by the first post-glacial post meltwater pulse. We suspect that the fringing reef transitioned into a barrier reef upon reaching the last interglacial reef flat platform, which has subsided to 87 metres. And we confirmed that before the transition, sediment-sensitive acroporids were absent, and only appeared in abundance after the transition. So how can we explain all these new findings? How do they fit together? Can we explain how and why the fringing reef transformed into a barrier reef? And will this solve the origin of Darwin's reef types? We propose that these findings and questions can be resolved by this three-cycle model of reef evolution. It shows how reefs develop during three cycles of sea level rise and fall around a slowly subsiding volcanic island. It explains all of the new findings from Tahiti. It explains how and why fringing reefs transform into barrier reefs. And it finally solves the origin of Darwin's reef types. So let's go through it, one cycle at a time. The first cycle starts at the glacial low stand of sea level. At this low stand, a fringing reef develops that's exposed to open ocean swell. Large waves resuspend sediment runoff from the volcanic slopes, and this chronic sedimentation creates stress that, that excludes acroporids and suppresses the reef's accretion. So that when sea level starts its post-glacial rise, the fringing reef can't grow vertically to produce a barrier reef. Instead, it's forced to retreat upslope as sea level rises. When sea level reaches the interglacial high stand, it stops rising, allowing the reef to accrete outwards from the shore. And during the rest of the interglacial, this prograded, prograding accretion allows a fringing reef to produce a wide reef flat platform. The second cycle starts after sea level falls to the glacial low stand again. A similar fringing reef develops that's exposed to open ocean swell. These, these waves suspend sediment, and that sediment excludes acroporids and suppresses the reef's accretion. So as post-glacial sea level rises, the fringing reef is forced to retreat upslope. As it retreats, it finally reaches the subsiding reef flat platform that developed during the previous high stand. Once it intersects the edge of the platform, a wide lagoon automatically develops, and this lagoon begins to trap sediment. This trapping reduces the sediment flux, allowing acroporids to return and colonize the fringing reef. Reinvigorated by acropora, the fringing reef grows vertically, 
keeping pace with sea level rise and transforming into a barrier reef. So this explains exactly what we see at Tahiti. The low accretion fringing reef retreating upslope, reaching the last interglacial reef flat platform at 87 metres, and then transforming into an Acropora dominated barrier reef that develops vertically from the same platform. The sudden appearance of Acropora in the reef front at the same time. Finally, the third cycle. It starts again after sea level falls to the glacial low stand and an open ocean fringing reef develops. Waves suspend the sediment, excluding acroporoids and suppressing accretion. And post-glacial sea level rises and the fringing reef is forced to retreat upslope. Now when it intersects the edge of the subsiding barrier reef flat from the previous cycle, the sediment is trapped once again and acroporoids return. And only then can the fringing reef grow vertically, keeping pace with the remaining sea level rise but this time it transforms into an atoll. And an atoll forms because together, subsidence and erosion have lowered the volcanic island below the interglacial high stand level. So there you have it, fringing reef to barrier reef to atoll, quadrat demonstrandum. In the end, Darwin was right. There is a genetic relation between reef types, but he was right for the wrong reason. Fringing reefs don't grow vertically into barrier reefs and atolls due to subsidence. No, they retreat upslope during sea level rise, but get stuck because they can't cross the wide reef flat platform that develops during the previous cycle. But this is a blessing in disguise because being stuck at the edge of the platform automatically creates a lagoon which traps sediment that was the cause of the misery in the first place. And without the sediment, the sickly fringing reef assemblage recovers to a normal healthy one and grows up to become a barrier reef. So the key to the transformation between reef types is the forced retreat of fringing reefs during glacio-eustatic glacio sea level cycles.